I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we the people learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. And it's the 4th of July this week, guys. You know what that means. <laughs> Time to get patriotic. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. These words were written by Thomas Jefferson in 1776. They topped the Declaration of Independence, and I think it's safe to say that they might be the most quoted words from that document. But many of the delegates that made up the Second Continental Congress uh, didn't think that those words really applied to a specific group of Americans that were uh, living and working quite hard on American soil. So rather than taking Jefferson's words to heart, they just went ahead and uh, just went ahead and deleted them. Let me explain. I want you to close your eyes with me real quick. Let's, let's envision a scene, okay? It's June, 1776, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Second Continental Congress is convened in a building that is at the time known as Carpenter's Hall. And the topic of discussion, the main topic of discussion, declaring independence from Great Britain. This has been the main topic of discussion amongst the delegates ever since Richard Henry Lee, a delegate from Virginia, first introduces the motion. There is some serious debate as to whether these 13 colonies can come together and form one united nation. And at times, the debate can get a bit heated. So at a certain point in time, Congress decides to take a little break. But before doing so, they put together a committee of five men that will draft a Declaration of Independence in the event that Lee's resolution carries. This committee of five men, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston all get together and it's decided that Jefferson should be the one to put pen to parchment and list out all the reasons as to why America should break its bonds from King George III and from the tyranny of Great Britain. So Jefferson writes a first draft of this declaration and from there he takes it to the rest of the committee who then take it to the rest of Congress who all gather together, look over the document, and uh, you know, decide to fix it up a little bit, see what needs to be cleaned up, see what needs to be revised and see what needs to be omitted. And it's during this revision period of Jefferson's first draft that uh, they decide to completely delete one of the grievances that Jefferson has written out against King George III. Now the grievance you'll read in the document today is the following. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Now, this grievance is aimed at the Native Americans. You know, the people that were living here before any of these colonists came along, and how the British Army was, was calling up Native Americans to, uh, to use them in battle against colonists. But there's another domestic insurrection that Jefferson alludes to in that grievance, and that one, according to him, in his mind, he feels, is being done by slaves. That's right, guys. In the first draft, of the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances that Thomas Jefferson lists against King George III has to do with slavery. The grievance reads as thus. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who have never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. Determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this execrable commerce. And that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die, he is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people on whom he has obtruded them thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges to commit against the lives of another. Whew, okay, wow, strong words from Jefferson. Okay, how about we break down this grievance just so you guys are fully aware as to what TJ is talking about. So in the first part of the grievance, TJ is basically blaming the king for the slave trade. He is blaming the king for the fact that these slaves are being brought to the colonies 
and for the fact that they're being transported in the worst possible way so that some of them are dying en route to the colonies. I do like the one part where Jefferson refers to King George III as the Christian King of Great Britain, using it in an ironic sense. You know, oh, the Christian King, this this merciful monarch. Who who? Why would he Why would he send these slaves over to die if you're so if you know if you're such a good and Christian person? The second part of the grievance, Jefferson goes after the king for allowing the sale of slaves to take place and for making sure that nothing will stop that sale from happening. And then in the final part of the grievance, he derides the king for allowing the British army to call up slaves to join their ranks in exchange for their freedom. So now, those slaves that are working for the colonists are now being sided with the British to kill those same colonists. So if you knew nothing about Thomas Jefferson at all, and all you read of his work was just this one grievance, you'd probably walk away from it going, man, this guy really just did not like the dreaded institution of slavery at all. Which is kind of ironic, considering that Jefferson himself was a slave owner, as were many of the Southern delegates in the Second Continental Congress. So when that grievance popped up, in Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration, and then that first draft was shown to the Congress, what did you think they were going to do? Of course they were going to delete it. Why would Southerners have allowed that to exist? In the South, you have to remember that the reliance on slaves, guys, was paramount. Their economy really would not have existed without slave labor. Because think about it, at the time, the South was exporting crops like tobacco, rice, indigo, all very popular overseas. So in order to keep up with demand, they have to keep slaves and they have to keep them working in the fields. How else are they supposed to keep up with the demand of the market? And at the same time, how are they supposed to continue getting their money? And now Thomas Jefferson, this hypocrite, was gonna come and tell them that slavery is a grievance that we're gonna hold against King George III as part of our Declaration of Independence? No, son, don't f with my money. But before you guys start pointing at the South and going, ah, God damn it, the South, they just, they just ruined everything again. That is not all the South's fault, the North, was just as much to blame for that omission. Because remember, while the South definitely had the lion's share when it came to slaves, there were some slaves in the North as well. But more importantly, any loss of slavery would affect the economy of the North. Because think about it, if the South has to transport their goods and their crops overseas, how do you think they're gonna get there? The South is not a shipbuilding economy. Their job is agriculture. That's where they make their money. You know who's making ships though? The guys up in New England, up in the north, that's more of a maritime economy, more of a maritime culture. So the more crops these northern ships could take overseas, the more money they were also collecting from that sale. So even though many northerners may not have enjoyed the idea of black people being oppressed underneath a white thumb, at the end of the day, the only color they really worried about was green. Or whatever color money was back in the day. Apparently money was in, came in myriad colors back in the day. In fact, after the Declaration's release, guys, Jefferson would later go on to write that the reason that that part of the Declaration was deleted was primarily due to delegates from South Carolina, Georgia, and some Northern delegates as well. And then years later, in 1822, John Adams would write a letter to Timothy Pickering and basically tell him that he kinda knew that that part of the Declaration was gonna get dropped. I was delighted with its high tone and the flights of oratory with which it abounded, especially that concerning Negro slavery, which, though I knew his southern brethren would never suffer to pass in Congress, I certainly never would oppose. I have long wondered that the original draft has not been published. I suppose the reason is the vehement Philippic against Negro slavery. This 4th of July, guys, the United States of America will turn 242 years old. In the past 242 years, America has changed, I believe, for the better when it comes to race relations. But don't get me wrong, we, we, we still have a long, long, long way to go. We are nowhere near perfect. There's still so much that can be done to bring Americans together, to bring Americans closer to each other. And I know that these are divisive times and I know it seems more often than not that everybody's at everybody else's neck. But this 4th of July, I hope that we can take a few moments to remember that regardless of skin color, regardless of financial status, regardless of religion, regardless of gender, regardless of who you want to love in your life, regardless of whether you were born in the United States or whether you immigrated to the United States, this country was founded on the words, all men are created equal. Yeah, I know it sounds corny and I know it sounds cliche saying that stuff, guys, but you know what, man? When it comes to the United States, when it comes to this country, I'm an optimist. 
I believe in the United States. More importantly, I believe in the people of the United States. I didn't get this tattooed on my arm for no reason. So happy 4th of July, America, and happy 4th of July to all of you that celebrate the holiday. Please don't shoot a Roman candle in your buddy's face. Okay, and that's it for this episode of US 101, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out, and hopefully you learned a little something new about the Declaration. Maybe you didn't know that that grievance was uh, was dropped from the document. I didn't know that originally, and then I was surprised to find... Well, I guess I wasn't surprised. Southern delegates and Northern delegates wanting to drop the idea of... So you know what I'm saying. But thank you guys so much for watching and for liking the videos, for subscribing to the channel, for sharing the videos, for leaving comments in the comment section below, man. I, I sincerely appreciate your guys' feedback and, uh, and your input on these videos. You can follow US 101 on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all the links down below in the description box. Click on them, join us on all the social media platforms, get involved. Guys, I will see you next week for an all new episode of US 101. Until then, I am all done. Happy 4th of July. Have a safe, wonderful, fantastic day full of barbecue and alcohol if you're of age and fireworks. And again, please don't shoot a firework in your buddy's face. I know it sounds hilarious. I'm laughing about it on the inside right now. But when they go to the hospital and they get third degree burns, you're just going to look like a dick. Don't be a dick on the 4th of July. Please just don't do it.